I mentioned that uh, she got to watch me grow up. She had a hand in raising me, I'll say that much. And uh, she got to see me act up, and she got me together too. And she was my former Bible school teacher when I was little. And so when she came, she said, Gu, I didn't, Mariana, I didn't see this. <laughs> she said, I didn't see you preaching. Teaching maybe, but preaching? This is amazing. And she said, I want to be here every time you preach. And she is here tonight. So God bless you and thank you for coming. Let's get into the word. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. We just thank you for who you are. Thank you for having your way already in this place. Thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy, for your patience with us, for being gentle toward us, for being kind and loving. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for uh, saving souls on tonight, God. I'm asking for many spiritual birthdays, God. If not in here, God, then for whoever's watching, God, Lord, that someone would become a born-again believer, God. Lord, that the word would touch them, Father, that it would change lives and transform others, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, God, I pray that those who are already saved, God, will be revived from hearing your word on tonight. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that your word is already blessed because it belongs to you, but I'm asking God, that you would use me in a special way like never before. Let your will be done. God, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. Thank you for breaking strongholds on tonight. We bless your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to read this uh, very familiar scripture to some of us, and it's in Psalms uh, 122, verse 1. A lot of us can quote this scripture. That is Psalms 122, verse 1. And it says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. You may be seated. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Now, the title of the message is simple and sweet. It is, let us be glad we have the church. Amen. Let us be glad we have the church. Now, there is no question that all throughout Scripture, there is a high level of importance that has been placed on the church. And now more than ever, we ought to be glad that we have the church. Now more than ever, we ought to be glad that we get to come into this place as one body of believers with one mind in here together to worship God and to praise God and to lift our hands and to give him what is due unto him, the praise, the honor, and the glory. We ought to be glad that we get to do that as a church. We ought to be glad that we get to come in this place week after week to hear the word together on one accord. We ought to be glad that we get to come here to share testimonies and be encouraged by each other and built up by one another and sharpened by each other. We ought to be glad that we get to come into this house to give thanks unto God, to give him his tithes and his offering and his praise. Just the thought of it gets me excited. Just the thought of coming to church sets me ablaze. It puts a running in my feet. Ever since I was a child, I've always been excited to come to church. Because church is where it's at. Church is where it's at. So now more than ever, we ought to have an absolute pleasure in the fact that we get to be here in the church. The church is important to God. The church is sacred to God. And the church is needed for such a time as this. I want to explore in the New Testament when God's church was being established in Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Now I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers, somebody say all the believers. Not some of them, but all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then, what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit 
and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Verse 42 said, all the believers, somebody say all the believers. All the believers. Yeah. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. These are all the things that they decided on one accord together to be committed to. Verse 44 says, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. Verse 46 says, they worshiped together at the temple each day. They worshiped together at the temple each day met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy, meaning they were glad, they shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Now, the Bible is making mention of what we call the early church. By this time, Jesus had already died. He had already rose. He had already ascended into heaven on a cloud, the same way he's coming back on a cloud. And not long after his ascension, the believers, those who, were, who had already believed in the message that Jesus Christ came to give about his Father's kingdom and salvation, that it would come only through him, those were the ones that were gathered together on one accord. And after they received the Holy Ghost, the Bible says they kept meeting together. They didn't stop. Day after day after day, they kept meeting together. And they shared the gospel message with other people who believed but needed to be born again. They shared the gospel message with the people that believed in the word of God but they needed to have the same Holy Spirit that they were just filled with. So they met in houses and they would eat together and they would fellowship and they would listen to the words of the preacher who were the apostles or Jesus' disciples. And even after they were persecuted and scattered abroad, it did not stop them. It made the saints of God even stronger. And they were still, even after persecution, they were still glad to be saved. They were still glad to be a part of this new fold. And they were still glad to be a member of God's church. Knowing this about the early church should make us glad that we have the church. Yes. Yeah. Now, we can read about so many people in the Bible who gave their lives for this. Countless people have been martyred because they believed in what Jesus built and established, which is his church. So we ought to be praising God and giving him glory for the fact that we don't have to get our fingers cut off. And we don't have to get beaten. And we don't have to get hung. And we don't have to get chased down in order to be here, but we have the freedom to enter into God's sanctuary without being beaten, without being arrested. Glory be to God for that. Glory be to God for that. Now we know that there will be a time of persecution because the Bible speaks about that. There will be a time for persecution for the saints, and there is right now in different countries, it may not be exactly like that in America yet, but there will be a time for that. But we don't need to be afraid because we understand that Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So that means the devil cannot tear down what Jesus has already made strong. What he has already fortified. God will always protect his church. The church is his people. And he loves us. I love the fact that we are a non-denominational church because if you think about it, Jesus' blood was shed to unite us. Many cultures around the world, yes, but Jesus came to make us one people. That's what he came to do. It was shed, his blood was shed to unite 
everyone of different races and different creeds and different backgrounds and different economic statuses and different social statuses. And once we gain salvation and we become a part of the church, we should all be united in Christ because division and separation was never the goal for the church. God sees all of our unique differences. Yes, he sees the color of your skin and it matters, but it doesn't matter because he came to establish kingdom for the church, for the saints. Ephesians 2, 14 through 16 says, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace with Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility toward each other was put to death. We ought to be glad that God gave the church their own identity. He made us special. He marked us. He made us holy. He set us apart from everybody else. We should look different and act different and talk different and walk different and dress different and sound different because that is what he made us to be, different. He gave the church her own identity, a kingdom identity. He made us special, and there is no place like the church. No place like the church. I have a list of three things that the church should do to maintain excitement and to stay glad that we have the church. Number one, we ought to stay holy and clean as a church. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27 says, for husbands, this means love your wives. And this is the part I really want to focus on. It says, just as Christ loved the church and gave up his life for her, to make her what? Holy and clean. Washed by the cleansing of God's word. Verse 27 says, he did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. Now Jesus did this work so that we can be clean, so it is now our job to maintain the holiness and maintain the cleanliness that he gave us in the first place, but how do we do this? That's the question. We do this by living a holy life according to the word of God, because that is how the scriptures say we are cleansed in the first place, by the washing of his word. If we love the Lord, we will obey his command. A good rule of thumb is if God's word said to do it, we ought to do it. That's how we stay clean. If God's word says we must trust him, we ought to trust him. If God's word says we ought to fast and pray, we ought to do it. If God's word says we ought to obey those who have rule over us, which is our pastor and first lady, your spiritual authority, then we ought to do it. If God's word says to love one another, we ought to do it. If God's word says that light and darkness have nothing in common and they cannot coexist, then we ought not allow darkness to infiltrate the church. All right. okay. If it is evil, don't let it get in here. If it is evil, don't let it get in here. Because you're the church too. If it's evil, don't let it get in here. Here. Now, the church stays clean when it runs off of glorious and righteous doctrine, not the filth that comes from sin, wickedness, and the lies that the enemy tries to deceive us with. So, but sometimes we have to go back and be reminded of those who came before us so that we don't end up making the same mistakes. 
So now even though the church was officially established in the New Testament, we can see God setting the stage for the church even from the beginning. And Jesus in Genesis, excuse me, God made the heavens and the earth. And everything in it was good. So he made man with great purpose, and that purpose was to worship him. He made man and placed him in this beautiful, sacred place, which was called the Garden of Eden. And God said that it was not good for man to be alone, so he made Eve, which was a helpmeet suitable for Adam. And this added, if you will, to the membership of this garden. Now there's one more person to be on one accord in one place existing together in fellowship together to worship God. God gave these members of this garden his instruction, which was the word that he wanted them to abide by. And everything was perfect. God had his people, and his people had him. And God's presence was in the midst of the garden. Adam and Eve were doing exactly what they were created to do, which was to serve God. And there was peace there. And there was joy there. And together, they lacked nothing. Now, even though everything was being run decently and in order, somehow, some way, you know the story. And if you don't know, somehow, some way, evil was able to creep on in. Such a beautiful and clean place was about to get ugly and dirty. Satan used the serpent to deceive Eve to get her to believe in his lies and not in God's word. Well, Eve ate the fruit, and Adam did too, and they were kicked out of this perfect place, and sin entered in, and God's people who were once holy are now tainted and sinful. And their relationship with God is now in trouble. Their relationship with God has now become damaged. The mission of Satan is to bring sin into the place where fellowship with God is supposed to take place so that God's children will become dirty because he knows that God will not dwell in any unclean place. So he wants to make you dirty. Then the song say, won't he make you clean inside? Won't he make you? Well, the devil's agenda is to make you dirty, filthy, stinky, smelly, rotten, inside. He couldn't care less what you look like on the outside. All of this is just, it's just temporary. So this was the enemy's agenda. His agenda is still to snatch the believer away from their union with Jesus Christ so that they will end up serving him even if they don't even know it. That is what he does every day. Never clocks in or clocks out. He just does it. But the church must stick to holiness and unadulterated belief in God's word. And that is how we are going to stay clean. Yes, we live in a world where there are multiple options, but there is only one true God, and that is Jesus Christ. There is only one true gospel. There is only one Lord. There is only one faith. There is only one baptism. And there is only one way to heaven, and that is through belief in Jesus Christ, putting your faith in him, confession, repentance, baptism in Jesus' name for the remission of sin. And we know that salvation comes by grace through faith, and it is a free gift of God, and we did not earn it. We cannot do enough work to earn God's grace, but he gives it to us anyway. We need God's gift of the Holy Ghost, and that is how we will become and stay clean. Hallelujah. When we come to God's house, we get to be reminded of the truth, so let us be excited that we have the church. Let us be excited that we have his house. Hallelujah. 
Another example is when God sent Moses back to Egypt to tell Pharaoh to let his people go. And God's plan was to have his people come out of Egypt so that they can come to a sacred place all together, all, I don't know how many millions of them, to come together and be separated from the nonsense, be separated from the sin, be separated from the filth, be separated from everything that was already separating them in the first place. He wanted them to be together on one accord to worship him. He set the stage for what he wanted us to do here in the church. And so when he sent Moses back to Egypt to tell Pharaoh to let his people go so that they can go to a place to worship him, God wanted his people to be set apart and brought out of a land where there was nothing but pagan worship, nothing but ungodly practices taking place night and day. God wanted his children to be free from the rituals and the sin and the idolatry that was all around them. God wanted them to be free from it all. He wanted to make them into a great nation. So Moses went and he led the children of Israel out of Egypt by the power of God. And eventually God's people, the same people that had acknowledged him as the I am and worshiped him, began to indulge in our godly practices, began to make idols, they began to get dirty. Even though God had already done so much, miracle after miracle in front of their very eyes. Can you imagine walking through an entire sea? I'm not talking about no little creek that, oh, there's already mud and it's high because there's surface. You can see that. No, 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 no. They didn't walk through that. They walked through a deep, 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 deep ocean. We can't imagine how deep that ocean floor was. We can't imagine if there was fish on this side, whales on that side, octopus. I don't know what could have been in that water. But none of it touched them. None of it consumed them. None of the water took them out. And they got to see their enemies become a defeated foe because God swallowed Pharaoh and his army alive by the water. Even after seeing all of these things, how can you see this and not know that God is the truth? How can you see this and not accept God as your leader, as your master, as your Lord, as your king, and submit to him and serve him? But that's what they did. God's same people that had honored him one day started to indulge in these ungodly practices the next day. Started to complain. Started to have a filthy mindset. Started to lack thankfulness. Started to be ungrateful. And it started making them dirty. Which leads me to number two. This is the second way that we have to stay glad that we have the church. We must honor God for the church. To honor means to have reverence. It means to have great respect for the establishment and the institution of the church. Now, I love, love, love having a pastor, a man of God, who is always willing to preach the truth in season and out of season, even when it's unpopular. And I came here at a young age, and some, as a teenager, and sometimes I didn't understand why a pastor would call out certain actors and producers and directors that would, you know, put little skits together to make fun of the church, because I didn't see it like that. I was watching the same movies that pastor was calling out. And I was like, what? Because I was so immersed in the culture. You know, that's what we did at Grandma's house. We went and we watched the Tyler Perry movie on holidays, right? We went and we watched all that. We watched it so much that I could quote it backwards and forward. I knew all of the taglines, you know, all of it. So I didn't understand that. I didn't have that thinking. And I didn't look at it as making fun of the church because I was still immature. And so you have these writers and directors and producers who will purposely write in their script to be like, oh, they do this in the church. Oh, they do that in the church. And that stuff is not funny. It's not funny. It might look comical. It might seem like, you know, and I was once there. I did too. Go to church like, look how she shouting. Look how she singing. Look how she do the ugly cry. 
Look how she opened up her mouth like this. That, 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 that. You're paying attention to the wrong things. Amen. Trying to make the church, the people in the church, develop a carnal mind in the church. That's not how we stay glad. That's how we play. Yes. If you want to play, go to the playground. Amen. You want to play, play with your kids. Amen. You want to play, play with somebody else but not God. A deep reverence and respect for the church. So I thank God for the man of God. I even had a minister who preached the gospel to send me videos of a pastor who spent his entire message making fun of the church because they thought it was funny. And they wanted me to show somebody else. This was recently. And I had to text them back. I'm not showing nobody this. Because it's not funny. Don't send me things like this anymore. Thank you. I don't care if it was nice or not. Because maybe nobody else has told them that's not funny. If, if that's what you're coming to church to do, you're wrong. And I had to be corrected in the same way. There are people who get paid big Bucks to put on theatrics, bringing Showtime at the Apollo to the church. Now I used to be a dancer, not like that, but I used to be dancing with my crew. I used to do battles, and you know I thought I was tight. But I guarantee you, and that was all for show. I won competitions, did all of that. But when I come here and do my dance for the Lord. It's for the Lord. It's because it's in me. It's because I love him. And if I'm dancing, it's for an audience of one. And that's why I love that we have that motto, it is nobody's business how you praise the Lord. If you want to jump, jump. If you want to skip, skip. If you want to wave your hand, deserves it. So we have people who are paying to go from church to church to church. They got their own tours, y'all. Some of y'all know who I'm talking about. They get paid to be the opening act for the preacher. To point out different things in the church. I see it. I watch some of it. Like, this is crazy. To walk up to people and tell them, oh, the Lord said this, but it's something funny. They like to get the crowd going. Who is that feeding? Churches like that are starving. We come to church to get fed. There are dying souls out there. I guarantee you that nobody, I hope nobody would do this in the right mind, will go to somebody's deathbed, see them dying, see them hurting, see them in pain, and be like, <laughs> That nobody in their right mind would see somebody come out of comatose and be like, oh, he's awake. <laughs> in their right mind. But that's what's happening in the church. People are coming here because their souls are dying. There's nothing funny about that. People come here and give their lives to God. And once their soul has been revived, and now that they're alive in Christ, they're rejoicing. There's nothing funny about that. So as saints of God, we have to do better when it comes to respecting God's house. When it comes to giving God reverence in his house. We must come in God's house and encourage one another and build each other up and do our part and clean up the church and give and do what we're called to do and serve in our respective places. That is what we are to do in the church. 
Now, as we shout for our new church home building land and property, which is coming, we must first take care of what we have now and respect God's church. I'm telling you right now, all my four children, they can get messy sometimes, be as messy as you want at home in your own room because you are in charge of cleaning it up. But all the little papers and everything else they get on the floor, they're not leaving this sanctuary without getting it up because I'm teaching them how to respect God's house while they're young. In Matthew 21, 12 through 13, it says that Jesus drives out those who were buying and selling in the temple because they were trying to corrupt what God established to be sacred. We must not tamper with what's important to God. We should love what's important to God, and we should appreciate what is important to God. Yeah. Jesus reminds the people of God's intended purpose for the temple. He said, my temple shall be called a house of prayer, and prayer brings power, and prayer brings anointing, and prayer brings correction, and prayer bring, brings hope. And prayer brings deliverance, and that is what is to take place in God's church. So we ought to be glad that we have the church. Number three, the third reason to stay excited about the church is not to leave the church. Don't leave. If you're at the right church, stay there. If you're under the right covering and the right leadership, if you have the right leaders who are preaching the right gospel, found in God's word, don't leave. When you don't leave, that's how you remain glad. Now, we know that before Christ comes back to get us, that there will be a great falling away, which is called the apostasy. And there has already been so many people falling away from the faith, but it does not have to be us. I understand or I don't understand how you can know God and not want to come to his house. How do you keep a job if you never show up? Matter of fact, if somebody said you won a prize of a million dollars, if you don't go down there and get it, you're going to lose it. A child, if they don't show up to school, they send the truancy officers to the house because there are consequences that take place when you don't show up somewhere that you're required to be. God's word says that our presence and our attendance in his house is a must. It is not an option. It is not, it shouldn't be a second thought. It should not be your plan B, but it is required. If you don't show up to work, you lose your job. If you don't show up for your college classes, you lose credit. You lose your scholarship. If you don't show up for that million dollar prize, you lose the money. When you don't show up to church, you will lose your soul. Amen. That's how that works. Amen. When you're not at church, you're only doing the opposite, which is gaining the world. And at the same time, you're losing your soul. I'm not talking about an isolated incident where you have to miss church and on vacation or you're sick or you're child. I'm not talking about I'm talking about continuously just missing. Like Pastor always tells us time and time again, God sees that. He knows your heart. He knows your plans. He knows what you were doing. He knew that you could make it. He gave you gas in the car. He gave you the car. He kept your lights on. He keeps shoes on your feet clothes on your back. He feeds you when you're hungry. So we ought to give him what is due unto him in his house. Hebrews 10, 25 says, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. We are rapidly approaching Jesus Christ's return. So in order to be ready, we need to encourage one another to be here. And when we are here, we must encourage one another to stay here. Don't leave. That's right. There's nothing good for you in the world. Every time you come to church, you defeat the enemy. Every time you come to church, you gain the victory over Satan because he hates it. And that should fill your fire. It should make you be glad. It should make you get stirred up. It should make you go up in a praise and be glad that we have the church. And I had to change my language. I used to say, I got to go to church tonight. I don't say that anymore. 
I say, I get to go to church tonight. I say, I get to preach tonight. I say, I get to sing today. Y'all should say, I get to usher today. I get to nurse today. I get to give my tithe, my offer today. I get to. That's a privilege that we get to be. Now, it has been Satan's agenda from the beginning to destroy God's union with his creation, to interrupt the flow of the meeting place, to take away God's presence from the place that he established that his presence will be. Ephesians 4, 14 through 15 says, there will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies. So, verse 15 says, instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way, more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Now, some people will show up at the coffee house, and some people will show up at their mama and their house, and some people will show up at their friend's house. And some people will show up at their boyfriend's house. And some people will show up at the clubhouse. But what about God's house? What about God's house? What about it? For thousands of years, he has wanted us here, and he still does. And this is what he died for so that he could abide in us, and so that we can abide in him. The Lord wants us to be reminded that it should not be business as usual when we come together, but we have to keep an excited mindset about the church. And we ought to be glad that we have the church. We ought to give God praise that is due in his church. <laughs> Ephesians 5.19 says, when you meet together, Sing songs, hymns, spiritual songs, as you praise the Lord with all your heart. And the word says, you will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Lord, reserved for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, that your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. And as, my, as I take my seat, be reminded, Potter's House of Jesus Christ, our church is about to grow like never before. There will be so many souls coming in, it will look like they came in by the truckloads. There will be so many souls coming in that it looked like they came in on a ship. There will be so many ladies coming in. There will be so many gentlemen coming in. There will, so, there will be so many youth coming in that we might have Give him praise. Give him glory. Give him glory. 
to stand in his presence. Can you imagine that every time we go to shouting, the angels are in heaven. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. They're doing what we do. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. This is good. God, look at your creation. This is wonderful. I can imagine that when we praise God, it looks like we're down here. Amen. 